things. Let's um, pray. We were reminded in the last talk that God gives more grace. Let's pray for more grace. Loving Father, we do pray that out of your abundance of kindness and grace, you'd help us in this last session to see in your word truths and treasures which will cause us to know and love you more. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is uh, our last chapter in the book of James, chapter 5, and it's a very practical chapter, as you may have noticed, and it's really a highly significant chapter. It almost gets more significant as the chapter goes along. I'm going to divide it into three parts. Uh, verses 1 to 6, I've called God's warning. Verses 7 to 12, I've called God's timing, and verses... 13 to 20, I've called God's saving. So three things to do with God, his warning, his timing, and his saving. And how wonderful that James, representing a God who doesn't just say the hard things and doesn't just say the sweet things, would say something which is balanced and full and good for all of us. First of all, God's warning, verses 1 to 6. Now, Listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. What a dreadful thing to say. Uh, James is a little bit like an Old Testament prophet. He's not pleasant. Uh, there were, I imagine, some prophets like Hosea who may have been quiet, tearful, but there were other prophets like Ezekiel who were always doing drama unexpectedly, shockingly. And James is a little bit more like that shocking prophet who says things in quite dramatic language. And uh, you'll notice that uh, in these early verses of chapter 5, he, he basically says, imagine me saying this to you this morning. Those of you who've got uh, quite a bit of money, start crying now. Start crying now. Start crying in your pews because your stuff has gone. The staff are angry with you. Your future is doom. Just imagine. Who's he talking to? Well, the commentators are divided. Some say he's talking to Christians. Some say he can't be talking to Christians. He's talking to non-Christians. I mean, could a Christian fall into the trap of um, being obsessed with wealth and money and basically perish? Well, we would say, no, a Christian couldn't perish because a Christian has eternal life and is saved. But the Bible never falls into the trap of giving some kind of neat, simplistic message. It always says, keep going, keep watching yourself, be sure, be secure, but don't fall into traps. And back in chapter 1, uh, James has talked about the rich in the church already. But does he expect a non-Christian to hear this? Is at any point a preacher getting up and saying, hey, all you rich people, wail and weep when the unbelievers are not here to hear? Well, he does say, doesn't he, in chapter 2, that the rich person may come into the church. So I suspect this is a word to anybody, believer, unbeliever. And what James is basically saying is be very careful that you have not attached your heart to your possessions in such a way that you've become an idolater. And when the film of your life gets rushed forward, you suddenly find yourself having made a massive mistake. And of course, this applies to the unbeliever as well. We want to say this, don't we, to our friends. Whatever you do, don't pin your heart and soul on stuff that will perish. Many years ago, I offered um, Christianity Explained, uh, it must have been at least 25 years ago, and uh, one man who was the husband of somebody in the church uh, came and said, I can't come on Tuesday nights, but I'd love to do the course. And I said, I'll do it one to one. And we met in the cottage hall, and uh, he was a very, very wealthy man, probably more wealthy than the rest of us put together. That's a guess. <laughs> mm. 
And uh, during the course, we got to the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. I think it's Mark chapter 10. And we looked at the rich young ruler and how Jesus talked about eternal life and basically said, if you, the rich young ruler, are going to follow me as your king, you're going to have to give up your king called money. You've got to make a decision. And you know what? Just sitting at the table opposite me, he said, this is me. And I'm not going to do it. End of course. And he walked out of the room. And uh, his wife, his family, are affected by somebody who has made this world their God. Obviously, the language of James is over the top. He says, your gold has rusted. Well, that's not likely to happen, is it? Those of you who understand the properties of gold. And uh, does he really expect rich people to weep and wail? Would anybody do this? Has anybody ever taken James 5, 1 and 2 seriously? But you see, what James is doing is he's expanding on Jesus, and Jesus gave warnings. He said things like this, sell what you have so that you'll have treasure in heaven. Did he seriously expect all his followers to give away everything so that they could have treasure in heaven? Not exactly, because lots of his followers still had homes and possessions, but they brought everything under the leadership of Christ. And if there was anything that wasn't under the leadership of Christ, that's what needs to be got rid of. Jesus said, you'll have treasure in heaven where no thief comes and no moth destroys. Because everything's going to slip through our fingers, as we've been saying and as James has been saying. And as I mentioned a couple of talks ago, if we could contact the believers who died and said to them, would you now say that that painting you spent all the money on, that holiday house, that boat, that whatever, would you say that that is really what life's all about? Of course, they would say it's not what life's about. It's not what eternity's about. So you remember how Jesus gave these warnings and James is echoing them. And he's basically saying that you must take care that your resources are under the leadership of Christ and you're using your resources with eternity in mind. And what could be sadder, I say this to myself as well as to you, what could be sadder than to collect and collect and collect for yourself and your family and never contribute to the collecting of sinners into the family of God? Let me say to those of you who are on the wealthy side like me, do a mental balance of what you're putting into mission for eternity and what you're putting into pleasure for now. And just ask yourself how the scales are measuring. You know, if there are thousands and tens of thousands going into this world and if there are dollars and cents going into the next, think again. You're not thinking in, in line with the gospel. Can I say to the young people who think to yourselves in this church, it's the old people who will put money in the offertory. Let me say to you that if you get income of any kind, now is the time for you to start giving some part of that to the work of the gospel. If you're getting $10 a week, think of how might you might give something back to the work of the Lord, because this is a word to all of us. And a day is going to come where our decisions about wealth will either bring great grief to us or great joy. Well, some people may have hoarded. Some people may have abused their workers in the church that James is writing to. We can't be absolutely sure. But he is having a word, verse 5, to those who love luxury. And I secretly love luxury, and I think you do too. This is a word that literally means soft. It's the only time that it's used in the New Testament. And because we're under pressure to be soft, it's not to be the priority for Christians. That's why we're so thankful for the missionaries who set an example in going somewhere that is not soft. And you and I must work and pray that we might not become soft in head and heart. Our priority is that the gospel would advance. In a few weeks' time, I'm speaking to the Gospel Patrons, which was uh, set up by uh, Simon Pillar. Many of you will remember Simon Pillar, and Simon Pillar is part of a business, which is a very, very uh, rich business. I mean, it, uh, it deals with billions, and yet uh, those of you who know and remember Simon and give thanks for him know that everything is very much under the leadership of Christ. 
He would never ever think that his money, his business had taken his heart. Um, whatever battle he's in privately, he is a really gospel advancing man and he set up the gospel patrons and it's my privilege and responsibility to go and speak to lots of people who are really quite wealthy in the city and say to them, your believers, will you think generously about the kingdom? And it's absolutely impossible for me to get anything out of those people unless God is at work by his grace. And I want you to remember that in all the things that James is saying to us, it isn't just, it's up to you. He's challenging us with the grace of God. He's challenging us with the mercy of God. He's challenging us with the resources of God. And therefore, we must be those people who say, whatever we're asked, oh Lord, help us to do it. That's the way James balances these things. So do watch yourself. Be careful that you're not devoted to this world. A farmer once wrote to his newspaper and said that his work was his top priority. And the letter in the paper said this, I have used every Sunday to plow and sow and water and harvest, and this October I am receiving a bigger crop than ever. And the editor put after the letter in the paper, God does not settle all his accounts in October. It's a good reminder, isn't it? God's timing, verses 7 to 12. Lovely, lovely verses. Please don't just pick out the lovely verses of James. Remember the whole book. Be patient, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its crop and how patient he is. You too be patient. Stand firm. The Lord's coming is near and don't grumble. Well, I wonder if you have waited very long for something. I know looking at you, some have waited very, very long for some things. Waiting long for loved ones to believe, that's probably the greatest burden of all. Waiting for perhaps a sickness to turn or pass, waiting for a change in your circumstances, waiting for an answer to prayer. There's a great deal of patience required, isn't there, in the Christian life? And um, I've started to use some of the prayer notes of uh, Bush Church Aid and some of the churches outside St. Thomas's. And I look at these dear people in very remote parts of Australia where the number of believers are so few in these small towns and the distances are so great. And I think, how do these people keep going when they turn up for a church and there's three people and four people? What patience is required. I remember when Ruth Brigden, one of our missionaries, came back and I asked her publicly up the front, what's been the highlight of your last three years? And uh, some of you may remember this. She said, um, well, I was running a Bible study one day and one of the Aboriginal girls up north decided to come to the Bible study and not to go to basketball. That was the highlight of her three years. What patience is needed. And James says, if you turn away from worldly success because it's not going to be your priority and you choose to follow Jesus, not, not, things are just not going to work easily. Everything's not going to fall in place as you follow the Lord Jesus exactly as you'd like it to. And that's why chapter 5, verse 7 is very, very precious, isn't it? Be patient. Be like a farmer. I'm sending these verses to people all over the place as I email them because we so much need in ministry to be patient like a farmer. He says, be patient till the Lord's coming. Well, does that mean the second coming? In other words, be patient the whole of your life until Jesus returns, until you see him. Or does it mean be patient until the Lord comes and visits you with blessing? Well, I suspect it's both. Be patient because he may visit you and bless you in a very remarkable way, but certainly be patient until you see him because there is a very great day coming. It's been proved and promised that a very great day is coming. In my previous church, I've mentioned this to you before, I was five years at Layla Park and there was virtually no advance in the gospel whatsoever. Um, people went backwards, people gave up their ministries, people were regularly coming to me and saying that their marriage was in trouble, their children were in trouble, they didn't want to do ministry anymore. And after five years, I was absolutely flat. And uh, when the invitation came here, it wasn't just to get away, I was actually um, holidayed and ready for more. But the invitation to come here, and I came in, I think, on the wave of some very prayerful people. 
And the very first Sunday, a girl was converted when she heard me say the words, Jesus is God. <coughs> Scales fell from her face. And within a few years, um, people started to come to the church. And uh, many of you won't have been present in the evening congregation, but the evening congregation grew very quickly and it was full and there were chairs at the back and there were chairs under the organ pipes here and there were people sitting over here. And it was just no possible explanation except that the Lord visited and was gracious. Same minister going nowhere in one place, same minister doing the same thing and the Lord visited. So think agriculture in your work. There are certain things we can do, we can sow. There are things we can't do. We can't reign. So we need to trust him. Be patient, says James, and stand firm and fix your heart. That's what he says literally, fix your heart. It's the same word that's used in Luke where Jesus fixed his heart to go to Jerusalem. We must fix our hearts in order to be faithful. Now, when things don't go right, look at verse 9. What could be more natural than that we grumble? Don't grumble against each other. Don't hit out horizontally because things are not coming as fast vertically as you would like. It's a very wise word, a very practical word. Don't go blaming, don't go grumbling as if it's all somebody else's fault. God does not like our grumbling. We know that from the book of Exodus. He's so good to us. We must keep looking at the things that he is giving us and not focus in on the things that he's not because the judge is standing at the door. I gather that there are 1,835 references to the second coming in scripture, 1,835, and in the New Testament, one every 13 verses. It's a big, big doctrine. Christ is coming. So be patient, be patient. Will we be judged when the judge comes? The answer, I hope you know, is no and yes. We'll not be judged for a salvation. We'll not be judged for our eternal position. That's been settled by Jesus. The judgment has been passed over to him. But we will be judged as stewards or servants. In other words, we'll give some account to our saviour of the way we have used our time and our talents. So do remember the coming of Christ. It goes off the agenda very quickly. I think I've told you that I once wrote to the briefing magazine with a little article on the second coming. I said, by the way, when was the last article on the second coming? And they said, oh, we've had lots of articles on the second coming. And then they emailed me back and said, we've never had an article on the second coming. <laughs> So uh, it just goes off the radar very quickly and we've got to keep reminding ourselves. It's closer than it's ever been. And uh, when the Lord Jesus comes, he says, lift up your heads, your redemption is drawing nigh. It'll be like the greatest airport arrival you've ever seen. It'll be like the greatest hospital visitor you've ever had. It'll be like the greatest loved one returning you've ever seen. And uh, therefore be patient as you wait. Now, he gives two examples of patience, the prophets, verse 10, perhaps uh, somebody like Jeremiah, who had to press on with great difficulty, and Job, who doesn't seem to me to be the greatest example of patience because he got quite grumpy, but he did keep his faith right to the end. And uh, you remember the, the writer Peter tells us that the prophets waited patiently to see scripture fulfilled. And so their ministry was slow and uh, sometimes they had to wait years and years and years for the warning to be really taken seriously. And sometimes they had to wait centuries for promises to be fulfilled. But God keeps his promises. So be patient. Now, verse 12, don't go beyond the truth by swearing an oath. What is verse 12 about? This is the person who's really uh, gone beyond the truth, gone beyond the promises, and think I'm going to have to say something now which is going to really carry weight. And um, oaths, of course, are perfectly legitimate in a courtroom because they're a concession to our sinfulness. We have to explain that we're going to be truthful. But what James says, and Jesus says the same in the Sermon on the Mount, is that we shouldn't be the sort of people who are always having to make oaths in order to be taken seriously. Our word should be our word. So this is a very um, a practical message 
to those of us who seek to go on being patient parents, patient family members, patient witnesses, patient neighbours, patient servants. We're in agriculture. There are things we can do, there are things we can't do. Don't hit out at people. Don't say more than you should be saying, but trust the Lord and keep going with your work because it's not in vain. This is a very important subject. Now, the last section uh, is God saving, verses 13 to 20, and there are two areas of saving. One is physical, saving from sickness, and one is spiritual, saving from lostness. Last week, I got an email from a man in Melbourne who uh, said he's grateful for the sermons that are online. And uh, he said uh, that the sermons had helped him to get the gospel clear. And I was very grateful. I was even more grateful when he went on to say that he'd just been given a position as a kind of a CEO with the Salvation Army. And I thought, how wonderful that a person who has got the gospel clear would be given such a position because we know that uh, he is going to bring to the Salvation Army work an eternal perspective as well as a temporal. So he's going to be dealing with immediate needs as well as ultimate needs. And as James comes to the end of his book, he wonderfully balances the immediate and the ultimate, the sickness and the lostness. You remember Jesus got this right because when he'd been healing in Mark chapter 4 and they came to him and said, come back and do more healing, he said, no, we're going on to preach. Was it heartless for him to say that? Of course it was not heartless. It was not his job to come into the world and make every village well. It was his job to come in and heal in order that people would know that he's the saviour of the world. And the preaching of the kingdom was part of his kindness. And then what happens in Mark chapter 1? It is not Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 1. What happens immediately after he said we must go on and preach? He bumps into a leper. A leper says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He says, I am willing. Be clean. So in Jesus is this perfect balance of the ultimate, the eternal, the really significant, and the immediate and we must keep the two together, and James does in this last chapter. Well, verse 13 looks very simplistic. It looks annoying, doesn't it? Are you in trouble? Well, pray. Are you happy? Well, sing. Are you sick? Call the elders. It looks simplistic, but I want to remind you that what James is doing is he's saying, don't forget God. Because when you're in trouble, most of us think a phone call. It takes quite a mature person, doesn't it, to go to God. When we're happy, we may go to ourselves or even to our pleasures. It takes quite a mature person to go to God. And when we're sick and we're not even perhaps able to lift up a proper prayer, James says, bring the elders. So, this word sick literally means suffering badly. And uh, this person is possibly too weak to even pray or praise. And so James says, we'll get some people to come and pray over you. It looks as though the person is so unwell that whoever comes is looking at them in their sick bed. And he says um, they can use some oil as a symbol, I presume, of blessing. I'm not sure the oil is medicinal. I think it's probably symbolic. Something to help you know that God is active and concerned. And the promise, verse 15, is that the prayer of faith, see what it says in our Bibles, will make the sick person well, literally saved, the Lord will raise, literally resurrect. Now, this is a very important verse because many people run with this and say, oh, look, if you can find the magic priest and he prays the magic prayer, you'll be well. And then, of course, we beat up the person who doesn't pray that well and say, if you were praying better, he would be well. And if you were more faithful, he would be well. Now, James is not saying that. James is saying... I'm not asking you to go and tell God what to do. That's not faith. I'm not asking, are you a magic person? That's not faith. 
I'm asking whether you will speak to God who is capable of saving and raising. And then you say, well, what does saving and raising mean? Well, it could be saving from sickness, and that's a perfectly legitimate prayer. It could be raising from a sickbed, and that's a perfectly legitimate prayer. It could be saving from sin. That will be seen to be highly significant. It could be raising from this world. That will, seem to, that will be seen to be highly wonderful. But I think the prayer of faith is the prayer that says to God, you know what's best. You know what we want. We would love this person to be well. How many times have we asked that various people in our church would be made well? It's entirely legitimate. And how many times have we asked that God would raise people from their sickbed? Entirely legitimate. But the prayer of faith says to God, you know best. We're asking you to save and raise. If you save and raise from the sickbed, we'll be thrilled. But if in the end you save and raise from this world, that's of eternal value. So we trust him. That's what the prayer of faith is. We trust you. Heavenly Father, we trust you. You know what we would like to happen. But whatever you do, may it be of eternal magnificence. That's the prayer of faith. And it's not feeble to say whatever your will is, because we are not omniscient. omniscient. Now, if sin is involved, verse 15 and 16, and sin may not be involved, there's not an easy link between sickness and sin. The devil may come and tell you there is, but you need to be very clear that Jesus himself broke the link between sickness and sin in John chapter 9 by saying that this man's sickness has got nothing to do with sin. Of course, it all goes back to the fall, but it won't, may not have anything to do with personal sin. But if there is sin involved, verses 15 and 16, and the person is willing to confess and be prayed for, that could be the most timely prayer of all. My old boss in the UK used to remind me that when you go to the deathbed of somebody and they really are at the end, it's not the danger of dying that is so terrible, it's the danger of sin that is so terrible. And we need to go in, don't we, with a biblical mind. We're seeing somebody who may be close to the end and we don't know if they know Christ. It's not getting through the river that's so difficult. It's getting through the river to the judge that is so difficult. And therefore, people do need this forgiveness. And that's what James seems to be saying here. And a righteous person, that is a person who's right with God, praying for that person, will find that their prayer is powerfully heard. He uses Elijah as an example. He's an unusual example, Elijah, because Elijah was told there would be no rain. I didn't even know if he did pray that there would be no rain, except James tells us he prayed as well. So God said to Elijah, there'll be no rain. It seems that Elijah said, Lord, could there be no rain? And there was no rain. And James says he's a very good example because he didn't have anything going for him. He wasn't all that great. He just simply asked God along the lines of God's word, and he was heard. So Elijah was not a mystic, he was not a superman, he's exactly like you and me, we can go to the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace in time of need. Now the final thing in this letter, and I think this is absolutely wonderful, is that James finishes without appearing to be Mr. Good Deeds. In other words, if you accuse James of being only interested in practical action in this world, his final burst is that people would be saved. He finishes, as one commentator says, with evangelical urgency. My brothers, my brothers and sisters, if someone wanders from the truth and you bring them back, praying, loving, writing, Remember, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. Would you just give a little wave of your hand if you've heard me tell the story of the diver before? I'll just tell you very quickly because it's uh, one of those preacher's stories that deserves to be told every now and again. 
but there is a Christian at university and he's witnessing to his non-Christian friend and his non-Christian friend is a highboard diver. And the highboard diver friend is not listening to the gospel, nothing's going in, nothing's making any sense, he doesn't care, two hoots. And one night the highboard diver, non-Christian, goes around to the university pool to dive at night. And uh, he goes into the pool complex, all the lights are off, he climbs up all the stairs right up to the high board and he walks out to the end of the diving board and as he stands there he puts his arms out like this ready for the dive. And as he's standing there on the end of the diving board he sees his silhouette on the far side of the complex just dimly and it reminds him of the cross of Christ which his friend has been telling him about. And it dawns on him how much he's been loved and he gets down on the end of the diving board and he sits there and he repents of his sins and he asks the Lord Jesus to forgive him. And while he's sitting on the end of the diving board, the guy in charge of the pool complex for some reason comes in, flicks on all the floodlights and the guy sitting on the end of the diving board looks down and realises that they'd emptied the pool that afternoon. That is a great time to become a Christian. The human race is on the end of a diving board and you and I are good agents for praying, <clears throat> for speaking, for giving and helping people to turn that they might have a multitude of sins covered over. Now James is a, is a cage rattling book and I want to finish with a cage rattling quote. Not from James, but from good old J.C. Ryle. This book was given to me recently, and J.C. Ryle was a man who didn't mince his words. And uh, you could have had five sweet talks this week, but you've had five sour talks this week. And uh, listen to J.C. Ryle before we finish. He says, we live in a day, and this is back in the late 1800s, where the principle seems to be no dogma, no distinct tenets, no doctrine. We have hundreds of jellyfish clergymen who seem not to have a single bone in their body. They have no definite opinions, they belong to no school, they are so afraid of extreme views, they have no views at all. We have thousands of jellyfish sermons preached every year Sermons without an edge or a point or a corner, smooth as a billiard ball. Awakening no sinner, edifying no saint. We have legions of jellyfish young men annually turned out from the universities, armed with a few scraps of second-hand philosophy, who think it a mark of cleverness and intellect to have no opinions about anything. And last and worst of all, we have myriads of jellyfish worshippers, respectable church-going people who have no distinct and definite views about any point in theology. They think everybody is right and nobody is wrong. Everything is true, nothing is false. All sermons are good, none are bad. Every clergyman is sound, no clergyman unsound. James is not like that, and I hope you'll not be either. <clears throat>